Welcome to On the Line. I'm Christine Williams. Coming up for discussion on our Viewpoints panel. Says an expert, teens lie, so deal with it. Later on, we'll be talking about state versus church. Stay tuned. These are the issues we'll be presenting today to our Viewpoints guests for commentary. Says a clinical psychologist, teens lie, so get over it. The bigger issue, how to manage it. An outcry from a group of Iranian Canadians after a Mennonite group invited six radical Iranian scholars for spiritual dialogue. And the former Grand Chief of the Assembly of First Nations has declared Israel a model for his people. Later on, we'll be talking about the issue state versus church, but first let's meet our Viewpoints guests. Rochelle Wilner is Vice President, International Vice President of B'nai B'rith Canada, and Paul McKeever is the leader of the Freedom Party. Thank you both so much for joining me today. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Thank you. Now, the first issue that we're talking about, it concerns people across the board, teenagers. Something of interest, to most people, you've got little kids. Yep. Rochelle, been it. you've been through it. Yep. Me too. Now, this expert is saying that teens lie. Parents need to, according to what he's asserting in this article, they need to wake up and realize your kid's going to lie. When your kid says, and there you have that title, their teens lie, deal with it. When kids come and say, well, they're going, for example, to some sleepover at Susie's house, don't be surprised if they're not at Susie's house. They may be at Lenny's house or they may be at Mary's house for a sleepover where right. the parents aren't present at all, as highlighted with this article. The biggest reason, they don't want to get into trouble. And he's saying, basically, it's how we deal with it. He's suggesting at the end of the article that when parents, I suppose, become too harsh, whatever that means, and I guess it, it's to do with whatever standards you set, kids tend to lie more. That's the insinuation. So I'm not sure where the two of you stand on this. You're teen experts all of a sudden. <laughs> I'm going to start I with think, you, Rochelle. I've been called expert in a lot of things, but this is a new one. But I, I, I did teach at one point in my life, but not teenagers. Uh, my own children are well past the teenage years, and I had never really thought of it in that context. But having read it, I think it makes perfect sense. And I, I have to agree with what he says towards the end, that uh, most teenagers don't lie for the the bad reasons you know most of them are doing it because they're feeling their own way they of course know better than parents what, what's best for them and uh, they just don't want to make mommy and daddy angry or be in a position of having them say no I, I think the best advice that he gave to is towards the end as well that parents have to be very strong role models yes. that that you know you have to be honest with your children, Perfect. Uh, that you have to be, you, you can't keep secrets from your children. When you tell them they can't do something, you have to have a reason. And of course, if your daughter comes home and says she's sleeping over at Susie's house on Friday night, you have to call Susie's mom and make sure she knows that this is happening. You know, I, I'm sorry to have to say this, but I think that you gave better advice than the expert in this article, <laughs> I must say, because the role model that he was talking about, the example he was giving is, well, don't get very angry or don't get very upset or be too punitive when oh, it no, comes I to that and, and sometimes you can be angry and at times it, being punitive has its place but what you said there modeling don't lie for yourself be honest with them have an open contact check out I think well, is excellent advice. Well, I it's can only think back to when I was a teenager, and I was one of those wimpy kids. You know, if I was told to do something, I just did it, and, and that was the way it was. But, but I, I think back, and I remember that my father was a worry wart, and I was expected to call home at a certain point in the evening once I was going out with, you know, with friends. And my friends used to say, how can you be such a sucky kid? Like, <laughs> why, why do you have to report to your parents? And I said, I'm not reporting to them, and, it, and it's not a question of trust. My father worries 
worries. And why should he worry about whether I'm all right if I can you just let him know I'm all right? You are the dream teen. You are dream teen. But, but, you know, I think if, if teenagers can understand that parent, it's not a matter of trust, and I think kids misinterpret. And as soon as you try to impose any kind of restriction, oh, you don't trust me. But it's not a matter of trusting them. It's a matter of not trusting society anymore. You know, how, sa how safe are the roads? How safe, how, how safe are the streets? You know, it's not like it used to be. Where will you be? Because I want to be sure you're in a safe neighborhood. And if you tell me you're at Susie's house, I want to be sure that Susie's mom thinks mm -hmm. it's okay for you to be. What if she's being punished for something and is told yes. she can't have friends over? So as long as, and if the kids know that, that we care about them, from a caring perspective, not from a trust perspective, I think it. I think they accept it much more readily. Wow, Rochelle, <laughs> you're good, <laughs> Paul. I like it too. Your kids aren't teens yet, so you're in the learning stage. Sure, oh, I, I, a teenager I, were you? That's right. Well, I, you Confession know, confession time. <laughs> <laughs> probably not quite as bad as the one in there, but uh, and some of it rang a bell. But I'll tell you, you know, what I've been doing with my younger children, uh, I only have two, and they're both young, uh, is 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 saying, look, you know, um, your word is the most valuable thing you have. And I teach that to them at every opportunity mm. so that they understand that they have, there's this value in being a truth teller, a, a value in being honest, that they, only they can erode. And that there are bad negative consequences for being known to be uh, someone who doesn't keep his word or someone who tells lies. So I, I just show them the consequences and with respect to the negative things they might get into, Again, I think, you know, I don't bring them up prematurely, but if I see there's an interest, I say, well, let's talk about what the mm -hmm. consequences are of those life decisions and uh, try to show that uh, things aren't a bed of roses if you make certain decisions at the wrong time yes. or without enough knowledge. Um, and, and show that, you know, there are consequences. People have uh, taken turns from which they can't return. Uh, and I try to let them know that those mm -hmm. things exist, that there, you, there isn't always a way back. But would it shock you if your kid told a lie or if you caught your child telling a lie? I think I probably have taught, caught my child telling <laughs> there a go. lie. There you go. And so this uh, yes, surprise you. of course. But, but it no. depends what it, what, depends what, what, what it, it is. is. Yeah, yes. and, and, I, and I'm, I'm talking about, you know, did you leave the door open or not right. type or of lies. Or is your homework done? Yeah, mm -hmm. well, no, even there, I've been pretty lucky. But the homework I, is a big one. <laughs> <laughs> when I didn't get homework when you know I did. Yeah. That's, That's right. right. <laughs> but, you know, I, for example, on the homework, I did have one incident where there was a test the next day. And my advice to him was, you know, if you expect me to give you a dollar when you get a B on that math exam, I said, you're dreaming. I don't pay for Bs, and neither does the world. <laughs> and he sat and thought about that for a minute. And, you know, I give him the example of the bridge building engineers. You only get one chance to build it right. And if you build it wrongly, if you do your calculations wrongly, people will die, and you'll never be working again. In fact, you'll probably be finding yourself inside a cell. So people depend upon not only uh, you know, honesty, but diligent thought. Now this could be new territory for a lot of people because if there's one thing that I find comes across clear in a lot of these articles about parenting, books that were written, certain expert advice, not all, some believe in the tough love and once again I'm using tough love in quotes mm -hmm. because there's a difference between tough love and brutal love where it becomes, yeah. it can become unreasonable. But our society today is not comfortable with the word consequences and I got that feel from this article as well. Not comfortable with it. And, and yet it's one of the most natural, uh, ev natural things that we have to deal with in life because there are consequences for everything that we do. Whether it's something we say, you, you can't retract what, I mean you can, yes of course you can apologize, but an apology only goes so far. It doesn't undo the damage that can be done by saying that's something right. that's hurtful, inappropriate, offensive or whatever. There are consequences for the work we put into something. Either mm -hmm. you excel or you don't excel. Mm -hmm. Consequences in who you choose to be friends with. I mean, it's, it's reality. It's, it's, reality. You know, and, and I think what you're doing with your young children is terrific mm -hmm. because you're teaching them to be part of the process in making the decisions for themselves. You're, you're giving them options and they're still young enough that they can absorb that and you're also keeping the lines of communication very, very open with, with, with you as the parent. Rochelle, you're a natural <laughs> counselor. <laughs> and I'm feeling better already. <laughs> there you go. You got it right here. <laughs> We're going to go for a break now. When we come back, well, of all people, the Mennonites mm -hmm. have stirred controversy and outrage among some Iranian Canadians. We'll tell you why after the break. Stay Good tuned. Job. Good job.
again and welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. The second issue we're talking about, well, take a look at this headline, Mennonites gesture to Iran spurs protests. You might be wondering why, of all people, the Mennonites, well, the Mennonite Central Committee of Ontario, they invited six Iranian scholars to the University of, of um, Waterloo for a conference, and these are Shia, of the Shia type. These are known militant types. They are seen as aggressive. In fact, they're hardline people of Iran. They're known to support the views of the president there. Basically, they are enemies of democracy. And if you dare oppose the president, you'll either be jailed, tortured, or killed. Now, the Mennonites are not known for this. They're not known to get political. In fact, they're known to be very anti-political. But here you see in this article something of a very political type. I find it baffling, amazing, and I can't understand why. Because when you look at it in terms of dialogue, yes, faiths dialogue together, but once you start getting into, we're not talking moderates here, we're talking about radicals that have, that their, their political views and their religious views are very radical to the point of killing people in a brutal way and it's intertwined in one piece. Why would this Mennonite Central Committee want to meet with this group knowing that it's so upsetting to so many people that even have family over there. It's the Iranian Canadians, the, this group, that's right. angry about what's happening here. And I want to know where the two of you stand on this. Uh, I mean, you've summed it up brilliantly because it's, it, it's appalling to me that they would do this kind of outreach. And I can only think it's either complete naivete, which is hard to believe because these are functioning adults, or it's bordering on stupidity, thinking that they're going to make a difference and they're going to be able to turn their thinking around. Or there's some kind of an underlying message that they're trying to send that says maybe these guys are on the right track and uh, democracy as we know it isn't the right way to go. But it's certainly, they're certainly can't be a positive outcome. I mean, there, are, you know, there, there are certain people that, of course, you can dialogue with and you can make inroads with, but then there are people whose thinking is so far beyond the 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 norm, the range mm -hmm. of normal, that dialogue isn't going to help. And, and besides, I mean, they said that these six people were advisors to the uh, advisors to, that to, the, to, to the president uh, Mahdi Nijad, and mm -hmm. and given that, if they were to say anything that didn't go along with his hateful, his, I mean, he's anti-Israel, he's anti-Jewish, he's anti-West, he's anti-American, he's mm -hmm. anti-everybody but himself and his own dogma, if they were to say anything other than toe his parting line, they couldn't go back home. Well, here's a quote from one of the angry Iranian people here, the Iranian Canadians. These people are at the forefront of oppression in Iran, responsible for silencing all intellectuals who disagree with the regime. I mean, this is something we can't ignore here. And one of the comments here, maybe we're naive, but maybe things come from people who appear misguided or naive. Well, please inform me if I'm wrong, but people that tend to be naive or f foolish in some way, I don't see a lot coming from. I mean, if, if you're a, a believer in, in the Torah or if you're a Christian or belong to whatever faith, I know that scripture says um, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So I, I can't understand even this um, support yeah. of naivety in this context. It, it just blows me away, frankly. Yeah. I, I don't know how you feel about it, um, Paul. Well, I, st I start with judge and prepare to be judged. And uh, I've judged in this case, the, the um, regime in, in Iran to be a threat to the people there. Well, the, the world has be, deemed that. And, and to be a We're united on that. Absolutely, and to be a threat to, to Canada. And for them to be brought over here under the uh, auspices of a university to give this, this um, appearance of legitimacy to what they believe is really a disservice to everything we believe in the West. We are not morally equivalent, and they are not uh, rep uh, recognizing, as we do in the West, the separation of, you know, religious belief from military and, and harmful abuse of, of government power. Uh, I don't think we should be sanctioning this. I don't think we should be seen to in any way treat it as a serious way of thinking. I think we should treat it as we would treat any abusive and harmful uh, way of thinking. And just, that is to say, we reject it outright. And anybody who wants to sell it over here should just take the boat back home. Frankly, it's heartbreaking. And, there, and there's one other thing I, I think needs to um, be clarified here. It isn't even a we against they, because I know some Iranians. I know people of the Muslim culture and of the Muslim faith that are fighting for democracy along with us. And they respect 
people's point of view, and yeah. they are horrified when they see such injustices and people silenced in the name of some regime. So well, there are people fighting along with us globally on this, and yeah. but not these ones. These are the no. six at, at the head of oppression in Iran. Right. And look at who led the charge in, in protesting this, you know, at York University. Look yes. at who those professors were. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's clear that there is a division within, you know, as, as in any ethnic or, or multicultural community, there are going to be different, uh, different mentalities and different mindsets, different ways of thinking. And this is horrible. And, and, you know, as far as I'm concerned, we should be doing whatever we can to keep these people out of our country. They have no place in Canada. There are those who honestly believe, they, and, and I, it baffles me, they honestly believe that you could dialogue with these kinds of people. They honestly believe that you could negotiate and dialogue with the likes of the Taliban, that you could even, um, this, this yeah. well, former leader of Iraq, they, they really believe that, that yeah. all dialogue is and good. They, and they will you understand. You can talk to the devil, you can dialogue with the devil, and yeah. all is great. There are people yeah. who believe that. Yeah, and I think, I think underlying it all, ultimately, that, and what's underlying all forms of pacifism, and I think that's what we're looking at here, a group that's saying, uh, in a very public way to the rest of Canada, you know, you should be more pacifistic, you should be more, we should get along, we shouldn't be so militar uh, militarily involved. Well, look, <clears throat> that comes from a, from a belief that you can't really know right from wrong, that no one is right about morality, that it's not possible to be right about morality, that what's right for one person might be wrong for another, and what's wrong for one person might be right for another. So if I murder my neighbor, it's fine, according to some well, people. Well, so you know, if, it's, right if that's everybody. your religion, then hey, who am I to judge? Well, I am one to judge. I, I don't believe that every code of morality is equally valid, and I think we have to get away from that, because ultimately, uh, the, the result of that kind of outreach will be... A, a failure to take any action, preemptive action, and the next thing we might find uh, arriving on our shores is not a, a six people from a university in Iran, well connected with the top, but something on the, on the tip of an ICBM. I don't want to see uh, a nuclear bomb going off in the West. Why we're, why we're not taking steps over there in a military fashion to preempt their ability to do that, that's a more relevant question to me than why we aren't uh, speaking with radicals in Iran. I, I, I think it's wow. just outrageous. Yes. Anything else to add to that before I, we go for a break? No, it's I, been all said. I, I think it's. I think we're. It's nice when we're all in agreement, isn't it? Well, <laughs> yes. I'll put on my other hat. Sometimes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure there's another one to put on in that context. Not in this context. <laughs> we're gonna go for a break now. When we come back, well, believe it or not, an Aboriginal leader, a top one, sees Israel as a model for his people. We'll be talking about why after this break. Stay tuned.
Hello again and welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. The third topic we're talking about now, this is Ovide Mercredi, former Grand Chief of the Assembly of First Nations. He recently took a trip to Israel and he came back and said, here's what he says, it's amazing what Israel has accomplished in such a short time. Now Israel is known, whether or not you're for them politically or against, they're known to be a very progressive culture and society. He was impressed by this. And he sees Israel as in a country, in a land, as he says, that's scarce with both land and water resources. He sees that as a model for his people. I mean, we all know, well, some more than others, the native issues here in Canada, some of the oppression, some of the conditions they're living under. He saw this as a model, the way Israel has developed over the years, as a wonderful model for his people. And you, this wasn't new to you. I, I have not, not seen this. Um, no talked about much in, in the general media. This came from the Canadian Jewish News, but it was no news to you. Not at all, and I, and I can show you uh, press releases going back to, to 2003 when, uh, when this really became a more of, a, of an official or a formal working arrangement. And if you can remember back in 2003, there was a serious problem with David Ahenikiu and his spewing of anti-Semitic rhetoric and, and then the, the whole aftermath. And it was uh, one day while we were, we were meeting with uh, Chief Fontaine in our national offices, that uh, we decided to do some real outreach in a very meaningful way. And we, uh, we sponsored a, a Holocaust uh, and Hope educator study mission in the past. We've done it for many years. And that particular year, we decided to do outreach to the Aboriginal community. And we invited them to select or find or, or you know, to try to recruit one educator from each province. And, and we would take that group of educators at no cost to them, uh, it would be fully funded, to Israel to study the Holocaust in the context of anti-racist education here in Canada. Well, of course, the Aboriginals can well relate to anti-racist mm -hmm. education That's because right. they themselves have been, you know, the Aboriginal victims in, in their country. And when this group came back, we had the opportunity to meet with some of them. And I have to tell you, we were in tears at their comments mm -hmm. because they felt, first of all, they came back feeling very validated. They felt validated as Aboriginals and, and, as, and they felt that they had met with, they, the Aboriginals of North America, had returned from meeting with the Aboriginals of the world. And it was on a very spiritual level, it was on an emotional level, and it was on an educational level. And the, the bonds that were created were so amazing that they have had three more trips since that they have arranged on their own and that they have actually funded. And there are many, many examples of, of what they learned uh, that can be translated into their communities. Wow. You know, the self-sufficiency and the need to, mm -hmm. the, the, the real need to work to making things better for themselves. Wow, very, very and positive. I, and it's very, very positive. Mm -hmm. I think it's wonderful. Paul. You know, I have two minds about this. I mean, first of all, the, po the positives. Uh, you know, any kind of trade between countries or, uh, you know, regions of the world, I'm totally in favor of it because it's going to grow the economy and it's going to create valuable trade links. I think the, the example of Israel is, a, is amazing. How anyone can grow oranges in the middle of a desert uh, is beyond me, but wow. they do it. And yes. I think that was an amazing thing to learn. Absolutely. But technology alone mm -hmm. is not going to be any, any uh, countries or any regions... Uh, sole means of success. You have to back that with uh, a firm commitment hmm. to the idea, to my mind, of um, personal ownership and, uh, well, I'm a big advocate of capitalism. I think it's really the only, the real, the only hope for any economy. Yeah, so, but capitalism, but not capitalism at any cost. You've got to be careful when you call yourself no, a I, capitalist. Yes. Yeah, I, I think capitalism is, is, a, is the only life uh, positive, uh, life-affirming mode of trade uh, available to the world. And I think if if uh, people in uh, Grand Rapids, for example, where they have water problems, et cetera, uh, ha have um, 
a personal stake, and I'm talking mm -hmm. a personal proprietary stake, instead of saying the whole community owns this, but none of us is in particular responsible for it, if there's one person, for example, that owns a fishery, well, you want to bet that person is going to take care of that fishery, make sure the water is clean, make sure the fish are fed, because it's their means of survival, it's their means of making a profit. So the only downside I see of this, is, well, there's two downsides. Mm -hmm. One, the trip was financed by the government, which I'm not big on trade missions. Um, I think, they, I think there, was, uh, there was funding to, to the group. That's a small point. Timmy was unclear, yeah. but it seemed, it seemed that way. Yeah. And the other thing was that I, I would hate for this to be seen as, you know, the band is going to own this, this uh, for example, this greenhouse. No, let the band members individually own, and own the, uh, the greenhouse. And let it not just be a greenhouse. Let it be a greenhouse. Let it be a water purification I'm, plant. I'm not going to argue your point on methodology here. It, yeah. it, it certainly yeah. needs to be refined. But, but there's one thing that... I'm not big on you know um, paying out, j just just giving out endless cash to make things better. Mm -hmm. But from the point of view of funding this, where these people have seen a clear way toward progressiveness, yeah. victims are victims, and it has an enormous effect on them. And I, I fully understand a lot of people were victimized at some point or another, or their ancestors were. There comes a point, though. You, you have to find a way to heal for yourself, I'm talking about here, and to move on. Well, you know, and for your children. This yeah. is, and for your, yeah, children. for your children. And this has been an issue that has been discussed in Canada for a long time. All of the money, the billions and billions of dollars that are going out to the Native peoples. However, I saw an interview recently that said, for some reason, all this money that you guys are talking about on the ground level where the people are, we're not seeing it. So it's a very big mystery where this money is going. Yeah. But I liked what I saw in this article, the, the attitude toward progressiveness. Yeah. I, I have to say I applauded that. And if it means the government kickstarting that, if you look at it in terms of um, return on investment, I think yeah, it long huge. term it, it could be, be huge. huge if it's taken seriously. You know, there's a, there's a Cree prophecy, what they call the Cree prophecy, and that is that you know, that uh, you know the white man came over and destroyed the forests and the water and everything and that one day the rainbow warriors will come back and restore all the goodness and and through education and etc everything will be restored and, and nature will be restored mm -hmm. I think it's kind of I'm not a big one on prophecies I don't believe in them but I do think that there's some wisdom in it I just think that the rainbow warrior isn't a person coming in and you know having a war the rainbow warrior is a person filling your soul with this drive to succeed, to, to take up personal responsibility, mm -hmm. to, to build a, a, a greenhouse, to purify the water, and to make a profit when you're so, doing so it. So you're applauding this. You're yeah. applauding Absolutely. this. But the investment needs and to be kick that? And yes. that's what they saw when they were there. They saw the rocks and the sand, mm -hmm. and they saw what was growing. I mean, if you, if you have the opportunity to go to Israel, you know, there's nothing like that first trip. And, and I always enjoy going back with someone who has never been there because you sort of see it again through their eyes. And the first time you see fields, fields of, of things growing, whether it's watermelons or vegetables or fruit trees, it really doesn't matter. They, they made the desert bloom and you wouldn't know it was a desert anymore. And they've got the fish and they've got the trees. I mean, the, you know, most countries are losing their trees because of fires and, and chopping them down to use. Israel is probably the only country that year after year after year has more trees than the year before because they just keep planting them. Wow. And, and and so I think when when these uh, when this group came mm -hmm. back from that experience, I think they were highly motivated because they could easily say, hey, if they can do it in the desert, and if they could do it where they don't get any rain, and if they could do it where, why can't we do that here? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you're quite right about this, uh, you know, there has to be something in it for myself, because mm -hmm. if not, what better interest do I have? And we all know that when Israel was, was founded, the basic, you know, the basic system was the kibbutz system where it was, you know, it shared, shared everything. You know, they ate in this, they had their, their dining room for meals and they had their daycare and they, each person had their job. You know, each contributed. Work together. One. You know, I and, really hope this But you know what, that's falling works. apart. I don't think there's one left. Oh boy. I don't think there's one left, and for the very reasons that you said, because they all wanted a piece. Mm -hmm. And now there are many, you know, geographically they're still living together, but, uh, but, but it's not communally owned anymore. Everybody has their own house with their own kitchen, mm -hmm. and they cook their own food, and they do their own job, and they get paid for their jobs. I'm, I'm, still, hope, I'm still hoping, and, and, and I'm still hoping according to this article, though, that there's progression here, because this summer is not promising to be very nice. Natives have leaders, Fontaine has said that natives have had enough and we're in for a heated, a summer, heated summer according to predictions. So Caledonia, let's hope this takes off. Of so yes, let's, exactly. Let's like hope Caledonia. this is good news and, and I certainly hope so. And our time for viewpoints is up.
Thank you both so much for joining me today. It Thank goes you. too fast. Way too fast. It goes too fast. <laughs> We're going to go for a break. Now, when we come back, we'll be talking about state versus church. Stay tuned. Here, I'm going to leave you.